Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. I started this trek to this moment 41 years ago. It was when I first understood John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. And that night, while reading a book that Hal Lindsey wrote, I accepted Christ. And my life has changed, and it's been a trek. Perfect? No. Have I arrived? No. But God's still working on me. Yes, dear, I know. I'm going to switch over here in a minute. Chuck, I thought you were going to introduce me. I'm Steve Leverage, by the way. <laughs> and uh, many of you know me. Some of you don't. So now you do. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Matthew, or excuse me, not Matthew, Rome, or, no, not Romans. <laughs> You'll come around to it. I'll get to it. We're going to be looking at uh, Revelation chapter 3. We want to start in verse 14, but before we get there, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we do thank you now for this time. We thank you, Lord, for providing our, your son for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the work that he's done that's finished, and that we reap the benefit. We just ask now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that our minds, our hearts would be cleared out and that we could accept the word and live by it. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to just read through this text this morning to start with. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful, and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. He says, because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The King James says, I will spew you out of my mouth. He says, because you are rich, or because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Because of this, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. To those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, as I read this, through some three months ago when pastor asked me to preach this day. I knew he wasn't going to be here. He was, he's in uh, Indiana with his family to celebrate Christmas. And with a new baby on the way when he asked me, he says, I don't want to have to be rushed to get home and to preach. 
he didn't specifically ask for this message. And he said, you preach what God lays on your heart. Well, the next morning, I already knew what God laid on my heart because he gave me the title for this message. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's how I knew what he wanted me to do. When I told Pastor the following Sunday morning what I was going to be preaching on, he's like, he says, I hope this isn't going to be a salvation message. He says, not that people don't need to be saved, but he says, that's not what God's talking about. And I said, I know, Pastor. I know all about that. For some, it may be a salvation message. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus is Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Today is that day. If you have never believed, it's it's just that simple. All you have to believe is that he died for you. And you can be saved today. He starts this in verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now I had to ask myself, who is the angel? Anybody got a clue? Okay. Actually, he's writing to the pastor or the elder of the church or one who comes in as an evangelist. He's the messenger of God. That's what an angel means here. Not necessarily an angel, but someone who stands in as the messenger for God. So he says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this. Who's the amen? What? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Why would we call him the amen? What? He did. Absolutely. That's what I wrote down in my notes. He was on that cross. He was being crucified some 2,000 years ago. And when he was about to that point, he prayed and said, Lord, here's my spirit. But then he turned and he said, it is finished. Then he gave up the ghost. It is finished. What's finished? Have you thought about that? Something else happened at that moment too. We're going to check on that in a minute. But when he said, it is finished, you can find that in John chapter, oh, i got to look at my notes. i got a good memory, but sometimes it's... uh, a little faint. John chapter 19, verse 30. You don't have to turn there. But that's where he says, it is finished. You see, in the Old Testament, after the fall of man, God had made a way that we could at least have fellowship with him. It was a way of covering of our sins. And that was basically once a year, the priest, the high priest, was able to go into what was called the Holy of Holies. He started out in the holy place, and he went around a veil and went in there to make an offering for our sins, or for the sins of those people in those days. And that was all just part of him loving us and not giving up on the human race after the fall. But when Jesus was on that cross, he put an end to that. That's why he said, it is finished. When he put an end to that, when he said those words at that very moment, that veil, which was a woven material, almost four inches thick, was torn from top to bottom. No one was there to do it. It just happened. Because God agreed with what Jesus just said happened. It is finished. And he made a way for us to be able to go to him directly without a priest in between. That's through Jesus Christ. Because he paid the price. It's like an exclamation point 
when you think about it. The amen. Hallelujah. Look what he's done for us. Look what the Lord has done. Isn't God awesome? He's the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. Who's that? Jesus again. Absolutely. He's known as the Word of God. We can find that in John chapter 1. We can turn there. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So here's Jesus, the true and faithful witness, the Word of God. You know, you can take your Bible at any time, and you can cross-reference it, you can read it, you can believe what it says. The Word of God is inerrant. It's without mistakes. It doesn't contradict itself. Some would say that it does. They're wrong. Uh, I also had another verse here that Mitch doesn't have back there, and that's Hebrews chapter 1. You want to turn there? Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he, he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in the last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the world. See, he's the creator. And the next part here talks about him being the creator. It says the beginning of the creation of God. He's the source of the creation of God. He was there. He's the origin of of the creation of God. Jesus is the creator. You say, well, how can he be the creator? I thought God created. Isn't Jesus God? Yes, he is. Amen. So he's just laying out his credentials here as we get into more portions of Scripture. It says he's the beginning, the creation of God, and it says he says this. I know your deeds. Who's going to know us any better than the guy that created us? The God that created us. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Jesus uses these words, I believe, to the city of Laodicea and the church in Laodicea for one reason. It should speak to their hearts. You'd say, why? Well, Laodicea was known for four things at least. One of those things was they had had a problem with their water supply. Well, it was a growing city. There were some other industries going on there. And they needed a constant water supply. And at times in the dry season, it dried up. Whether they had a shallow well or whether there was a spring there, I don't know. But I've read that they had decided they needed to grow. They need water constantly. And so they checked around in an area around Laodicea, and they found a hot spring. It was actually a little higher than the city. And so they constructed aqueducts. Aqueducts then were probably made out of stone. They might have been trenches in the rock. I don't know. But what happened was, when that water, which was a hot spring, so it's hot. It's pure water because it's hot. It killed all bacteria. And yet, when it would go through this aqueduct and reach the city of Laodicea, it was lukewarm when it got there. And I believe that's why Jesus talked about 
because their hearts were lukewarm. And when I mentioned Laodicea here, who was he writing to when he was writing to Laodicea? You remember? What? The church. Who's the church? Believers. Absolutely. This was written in 95 AD by John. It was written down by John. It was dictated by Jesus himself. Jesus knew their hearts. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. And he says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth or spit you out of my mouth. Amazing. He knows their hearts. Hmm. Written to the church, so they're believers. Can a believer be lukewarm? Obviously. Because you say I am rich, verse 17, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Hmm. They said, I'm rich. Why did Jesus use these words? Laodicea was known to be a banking community in Asia Minor. It was maybe one of the first banking communities. People came there from all over to invest their money. A lot of the people in that community became wealthy in the eyes of the world. They became rich in the eyes of the world because of all the activity that the banking industry brought in. And yet he says, you say I'm rich, but he says, you're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Wow. Here he is using what goes on in their very own city to get their attention. And have become wealthy. You know, wealth that the world has, oh, that's all fine and dandy to have money, to have homes. That's all great. But he says you have, you say you have need of nothing. Hmm. I wonder, when we say we have need of nothing, does that include Jesus? Does that include His Holy Spirit that was given us as a deposit for the better things to come? It certainly could. And that's why he goes on to say here, I believe. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire. There were a couple other things we need to explore here. He talked about being blind and naked. Laodicea, known for some things. Here again. There was a school of medicine in Laodicea that produced eye salve. And the eye salve, they collected the minerals up by the hot spring that had settled there. When the water was hot, it came out, and they would collect these minerals, and they made a salve to use to anoint the eyes of people that had eye problems. The other thing was, Laodicea was known as a, a place where wool was brought after the sheep were sheared. And when it was brought there, it was processed. And I don't know if you know what a sheep looks like before it's sheared. And I don't know if you realize what a sheep's wool looks like after it's sheared. But it's not clean. Everything that sheep's been in, that wool has got on it. And so what they did is they washed the wool in this lukewarm water. They cleaned it. And then they 
they didn't necessarily dye the wool if they wanted it white, but they bleached it to turn it white. And they also, along with that, they did dye cloth and wool in this community. So there was that industry going on too. And Christ used all these things to get their attention so they'd understand what he was trying to say for them. He says, at this point, he said, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As I asked before, can a Christian be all those things and still be a Christian? Can a, can a Christian be all those things and still be a believer? Absolutely, because he talks about it right here. In my own walk with Christ, that which started 41 years ago, when I was the tender age of 26, so now you know how old I am. It was in 1979, by the way. God didn't change me overnight. And I didn't realize that the moment I asked Christ into my heart, I got the Holy Spirit. Did you realize the fact that when you accepted Christ, that you got the Holy Spirit? You may know that now, but did you realize it at the time? Absolutely not. You probably didn't. Do you realize that when you accepted Christ, it was only by the work of the Holy Spirit that you were able to understand what Christ did for you on that cross? He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may become rich. Not the riches of Laodicea, but the riches that you're only going to have really in heaven. In abundance. Yes, we have riches here. If we listen to the Holy Spirit. So that you may become rich. In white garments. So that you may clothe yourself. See, that's what the cloth industry, the wool industry, why Christ used that. And he says, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And he says, And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Hmm. Maybe do a lot of wondering, a lot of thinking, when I read through this the last three months. Do I as a Christian fit into these five things? Am I rich? Do I have white garments that the shame of my nakedness will not show? Here I had these notes with me and I haven't even been looking at them, guys. But it's all because, well, I know what I get like sometimes. I get nervous and I lose my place. And if I seem like I don't know what I'm talking about, I really don't, but he does. You know, we talked about the lukewarm. I remember just before I got saved, listening to a guy speak. And he was talking to something totally unrelated to what we're talking about here today. But he did mention Jesus a number of times in a good way. And he said, you know, there's only two things in the middle of the road. And so I waited for the punchline. Two things in the middle of the road. Yeah, he says, yellow streaks and dead skunks. Now think about that. Jerry, you've probably seen a few of these. <laughs> yellow streaks and dead skunks. Well, the yellow streaks is that line down the road that said, don't cross over here unless you're passing. Be careful. And the dead skunks. Hmm. I look at it different today than what that guy meant back then. But yet, when he mentioned lukewarm, what happens to a body when they're dead? They take on the temperature of the environment around them. A medical examiner, if you ever watched any of these shows on TV, will take a temperature of the liver to try to guess. And that's what it is. It's an educated guess. 
of how long this person's been dead so they can try to solve the mystery. But the dead body takes on the temperature around them. I think Christ was saying, you act like you're dead. Are we really dead? Or are we just acting that way? Why, why did these people act the way they did? Why did he wait and speak to them after such a long time? You know, when I looked at the book of Revelation and understood that there were seven churches that he wrote to, seven churches, hmm, seven. Seven is the number of perfection for God. Seven. So you think these churches were perfect? No. Perfection for God, though. Hmm. Maybe, just maybe he recorded these seven letters for us to go and read and to understand before the church age ended where we were at. What was keeping us from being what he wants us to be? And I believe in my heart that's what he was doing here. You know, the nakedness thing, I'm still thinking about that. It's like, but when God created man and put him in the garden with his wife, what does it say? Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 25. You don't have to turn there. Mitch, you don't have to go there. because I didn't give it to you anyways. It says in verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Oh, how can that be? This is pre-fall. Hmm. Well, if I turn the page and go a few more verses, it says in verse 7 that of chapter 3, then the eyes of both of them were opened. That was after they had partaken of the fruit or part of the fall. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, verse 8, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God walked among the trees of the garden every morning. And he would see them there and they would talk. They would communicate with God. They had this relationship that obviously the people in Laodicea did not have. God called to them and said, where are you? Because they didn't show up that day. They hid themselves. He said, I heard the sound of your voice. Or I heard the sound of you in the garden, Adam says, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. If you go back up a couple of verses up above where we started, when they figured out that they were naked, when they saw that in each other, they sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. Did it hide it? Not from God. The eye salve. Did they see like God saw? Not at this point. Not the Laodiceans didn't. They weren't seeing themselves as God was seeing them. So he says, you need to anoint your eyes. You need to anoint your eyes so you can see you as I see you. When he says anoint, that speaks of what? To your heart. The Holy Spirit anoints us. Hmm, maybe that's where we need to turn, is the Holy Spirit. God gave him to us for a reason. He said, he, Jesus said before he left, he says, when I go away, I will send a helper. 
He will be like a guarantee, a deposit of the hope of the things to come. Hmm. But how do we get there? He talked of that fire. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may become rich in a white garment so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and the eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What the fire? Wow. What does that mean? What kind of fire? Paul speaks of the fire. 1 Corinthians 3. And I'm going to start in verse 9 and go through 15. He says, For we are God's fellow workers, Paul says. You are God's field, God's building. Did you know that God was building you? From day one, when you believed, he started building in you. According to the grace of God which was given me, Paul says, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. Who's that other? We are building on that foundation. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're building on that foundation is what he's saying. He says, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, that which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, here's gold, silver, precious stones, hay, wood, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. There's coming a day, folks. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Now, we're not talking about works to get to heaven. We're talking about what God is doing in you after you're saved, if you let him. We're talking about what we do for God to bring others to the fold into this salvation so great and wonderful. It says he'll test the quality of each man's work. And if any man's work, which he has built on, on that foundation remains, he will receive a reward. Let me ask you this. Is that reward necessarily for today? Oh, it could be. But he's talking about future rewards. You will receive a reward. He didn't say you're going to get it right now. If any man's work is burned up, verse 15, he will suffer loss. Well, if it stopped right there, I think we'd all be in trouble. But he says, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. You see, a man can be saved, or a woman, and not live for God. But he's still saved. Yeah, anything we've done in this temporal body, but not in the eternal body, what we've done in this temporal body will be tested with fire. That means our motives are going to be checked. What we've done will be checked. And if it turns out to be wood, hay, or straw, those things are all temporal. They don't, they don't stand the test of fire. If it turns out to be wood, hay, or straw, it will be burned up. Go on. I, for one, don't want to be among that crowd that suffers loss. And I dare say most of you probably don't either. I don't want to be there and smell like smoke. And that's what he's talking about. Wow. We don't have to be. God sent us a helper. Jesus talked about him. All we need to do is tap in to the power that the Holy Spirit brings us. You know, 
In verse 19, he says, To whom I love, I repuve, reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. It's all nice words. So you understand them. It's not going to be easy. What he's saying. When you were a child growing up, and your father had told you to do something, he says, when I come home at the end of the, my day at work, he says, I expect these things will be done. Were they always done? No. Well, our father, our earthly fathers, rebuked us. Why? Because they wanted that job done, that chore done? No. Because they loved us. They wanted to instill in us a responsibility that they placed upon us to make us grow. You know, when I thought about this, it's like I can remember a few years ago there was a movement, not really a movement, but a lot of people were taking some something out of context from the book of Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by not my name will humble themselves and pray. Well, that's only part of the story. That was only part of the story. They didn't understand the rest of it. They took it out of context. Turn to Second Chronicles with me. We're going to chapter 7, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of what happened in chapter 6 so we get an understanding of what's going on here. In chapter 6, Solomon was following up on what his father wanted to do. His father was David. David always wanted to build a temple for God, a house for God, a place of worship, other than that tent of meeting. He thought God needed this house, and God didn't let him because David had fell well short in a few areas. But in chapter 6 of Second Chronicles, God lets Solomon do this. He lets him build this house for God. And he gets this house built, and it starts in verse 12, and I'm just going to tell you about it. Solomon wanted to dedicate what he had built to God. And as he dedicated this in prayer, it's one of the longest prayers you're ever going to see. It starts in verse 12 of Second Chronicles 6 and goes through verse 42. You don't have to turn there, but understand this, that Solomon set a precedent for all of us. He said, if your people, God, would somehow turn their backs on you, would you Make life difficult for them is basically what he was saying. Would you bring plagues upon them if, it, if that's what it takes? Would you, would, you, would you so distress them that they would turn back to you and look at the wonderful things you've done for them? And in verse 12 of chapter 7, God says this. It says, it says here, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself in a house of sacrifice. He says, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, and that's what Solomon had prayed for, that you would do these things, Lord, whatever it takes to get a hold of these people. He says, if I shut up the heavens that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, in my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. You see, without all that, what preceded, this doesn't mean much. If my people, and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. This is pre-Christ. 
And then he talked about people called by his name. God's house. But I don't believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology says that we are to take the place of Israel. No, we're not to take the place of Israel. But we're grafted in. We are grafted in as sons and daughters. So, are we called by his name? Christian. Jesus. The Christ. He says, if my people are called by my name, humble themselves. It's a hard thing to do sometimes, to humble yourself. You go to someone and say, I've wronged you. I need to ask your forgiveness. God's asking us to do that with him. He says, if they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Awesome. Isn't God awesome? Isn't he awesome? He promised this way back in Second Chronicles, thousands of years before today. Amazing. And it's still, it's still relevant. Hallelujah. So, in verse 19 of our text again today, in Revelation 3, those whom I love, here's the key, whom I love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it's really a possibility. It's for everyone. And yet he's writing to the church in Laodicea. Writing to these believers. Those whom I love, I reprove. Rebuke. You've been rebuked. I don't know about you, but I can remember times when I've done things since I've been a Christian that I've had this check in my spirit. I've been rebuked. God says, through his Holy Spirit, was that nice? Was that necessary? Don't care if it was honest, but was it necessary? Did it bring glory to me? He says, I reprove and discipline. Yeah, the discipline of pestilence. Whatever it is, the discipline of maybe just not walking close with God. And we turn around sometimes and wonder, well, I'm here, where's God? What happened? What happened to that closeness that we once shared? He says, therefore be zealous and repent. Turn back to what you had. Turn. Do a 180. Go back and find what you lost. Find what came between you and the Savior. That's what it means. To be zealous. Don't do it half-heartedly. Don't be like the people of Laodicea and be lukewarm about it. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's going to give us something here that maybe we've never seen before. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's not about salvation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what door? The door to the heart. We know that, and we've heard, that once we ask Jesus into our heart, yeah, did Jesus come into our heart? Where is he right now? Yeah, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So how can he be in our heart? Holy Spirit, that's right. So the Holy Spirit's in our heart. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, look. Take notice. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, it opens the door. You mean we got to open this door? Yeah, we do. I believe at the moment we're saved, we get all the Holy Spirit we're going to get. But until we open that door, he don't get very much of us. 
And that's a shame. Because when we give Him us, that's when He can do His greatest work. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Think about that. When you have a close relationship with someone, one of the things that you're bound to do is eat together. He says, I'll come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's a two-way street. We can communicate with God like never before, have this close relationship, and it's through this Holy Spirit. Wow. What's that mean for you? I can't answer that. He who overcomes, verse 21, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Who's an overcomer? Any overcomers in here today? I hope you are. I hope we can see that we need to be. Just by what he says here. I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. He's pointing to something here that maybe we've forgotten. Who sits down with Christ on his throne? Who sits down with Christ on his throne? The bride of Christ. No one else. The bride of Christ. The bride of Christ has got white garments. The bride of Christ, the church, is to be without spot or wrinkle in her arraignment. Raiment, excuse me be without spot or wrinkle, we can become the bride of Christ. Turn with me. I want to get this down just a little better for all of you. For me too. Matthew chapter 25. Mitch, you got that up there? He does. Matthew chapter 25. It's the parable of the ten virgins. <laughs> Why does that have to do with us? Let's read it. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Here we got the picture. The ten virgins, the bridegroom. You can see there's more than one of us here going to be the bride of Christ. Guys, hang on. This is going to be a different experience for us. Gals, they took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, it says. And five were prudent or wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Hmm. Oil speaks of the Holy Spirit and his gift and his work in us. They took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in the flasks along with their lamps. Now when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Sounds like us today, doesn't it? But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Verse 7, then all the wise, or all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. All of them. All ten. Remember? Five had oil with them in a flask. Five didn't. Hmm. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Too late, guys. It's too late. Be ready. See, I heard those words. After I had agreed 
to speak, fill in for pasture, and I'd already told him what the message was going to be. And I'm out working in my yard. And I heard the word, be ready. Be ready. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, here it is, went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. What did they go into? The wedding feast. Well, hmm. maybe we need to go on a little further here. And the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say, I do not know you. Just be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour that he's going to return for us. So does that exclude them from heaven? Those five that didn't have the oil? Tough question. No. But it excludes them from what? The wedding feast. I believe they'll be able to observe, but they won't be able to participate. You see, what we do with the gifts that he's given us determine what our reward in heaven will be doesn't exclude us if we don't have a reward. Because His grace was exercised when we believe. We'll be there. Paul said in Corinthians, but as by fire some will be there. They'll smell like smoke. They're not going to be in the wedding feast. They're not going to be at that banquet. They can observe it but from a distance. Kind of like Moses. God didn't let him go into the promised land. But he observed from a distance. He could see the promised land. Which is similar to that promised land. God says about Moses, just like he said about others, like he said about David, a man after my own heart. And yet, Not even Moses got to see the promised land. So where are we today? That's a question you have to answer. I can't answer it for you. He goes on in our original text here in verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit of God is speaking today to to us, to our hearts. He's calling us to not only run the race, but to finish it. You know, the Boston Marathon, I think about a race as being not a sprint to the finish. Not like stock car racing. (laughs) What is a marathon? There are thousands of people that enter the Boston Marathon every year. And there's those that are in the front and take off and they sprint for the first 100 yards. And then they slow down to this marathon pace, but they stay up front. Then there is the crowd that's in the middle. And they run and they jockey back and forth. And then there's some that fall a little bit behind. And I think back of the cold or hot. Why did God say, I would have you to be cold or hot? Why did Jesus say that? If we're hot, it means we're on fire for him. If you're cold, if you're cold, you still got a little time to make up here. You still got a little time to become warm, to become hot for God. But those that are stuck in the middle, In a marathon, that chunk that's always in the middle, that's where the greatest amount of people drop out. Not those that are in the back. 
not those that are in the front. The ones that drop out of the race are the ones in the middle. They're beating me, obviously. I just, I don't, I, I'm not going there. I don't have to. I've entered the race, and it doesn't matter. That person that's a little bit behind them, maybe in that cold spot, says, they're ahead of me, and I want to be in the front. And so they'll run through that crowd at some point in that race, that crowd that's stuck in the middle, and they'll wind up in the front. No, they're probably not going to win. Paul talks about a race, too, that we run. And he talks about it being a marathon. And only one can get the prize. But sometimes the prize is just finishing the race. Sometimes the prize brings the greatest rewards of finishing the race. Think about the people that you see in wheelchairs or on crutches, and they run the whole race. It might be hours after the first person that comes across that line, but they run it with all they've got. God respects that. He respects us when we, in spite of what goes on around us, will run the race. Where are we today? Are we hot? Are we cold? Or are we lukewarm? Man, I can't believe where the clock went. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you now for all the good things you've done for us. For how you speak to us through your word how you sent your son to die for us that we can become more than what we've ever imagined. And it's through your spirit who gives us power, who gives us strength, who gives us hope. Lord, I think of those five words that we use to describe Laodicea. Miserable. They were without hope. He gives us hope. Wretched. Wow. Lord, that's like we were built in a shoddy way. And that's not the case. You don't build junk. Poor. Lord, all the riches are in front of us. We are heirs with Christ, your Son. Lord, help us to see what you've done. Take the blindness away. Lord, give us those white garments. Let us earn those and so we can put them on and be at your son's wedding banquet. Lord, I thank you today for your spirit and how he's spoken to us. And I thank you, Lord, you still work in hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I pray this thing. Amen.